it's great to see so many people uh, here um, for this event. This is organized by the new NMBU Sustainability Arena on Sustainable Food Systems. Um, and, you know, I can't think of a topic more fitting to start off with for, for our sustainability arena than this one, global uh, food security. Uh, I should say uh, this uh, is being streamed uh, and recorded. So just so you know, for your information. So that also goes for the last session when there are um, for the question for the panel discussions towards the end. So the global food security situation in the world is very dramatic. According to the World Food Program, uh, there are 200 million, no, million people um, in acute uh, food insecurity, 200 million more than two years ago because of uh, the effects of the pandemic, uh, climate events, and Russia's war uh, in, in Ukraine. So that is sort of the, the, the dramatic backdrop for this, uh, this event here. Um, to, start off, to start us off, uh, I will give the word to NMBU's uh, rector, Kurt Rice. Thank you. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be able to welcome all of you to this event, and not least of all uh, to you, Kerry Fowler, uh, as the US Special Envoy for Global Food Security. As an American, I can. Uh, it's it's a treat to have the opportunity to point to something good and constructive that comes out of uh, Washington, uh, ra rather than the rather than the usual uh, fair. I'm sorry to say. Welcome to NMBU, or I should say, welcome back to NMBU. Uh, your uh, a previous faculty member at this university, and that is also something that all of us are uh, very proud of. Here at uh, NMBU this past year, we've been uh, working not only with our board of directors, but with employees, with students, with external partners to uh, develop a new strategy for the institution. And I'd just like to share with you the first sentence of that strategy. In Norwegian, it says, Norge's miljø og biovitenskapelige universitet skal bidra til å sikre fremtidens livsgrunnlag. And in the English version of our strategy, we've translated that as, NMBU strives to help safeguard the basis for life on earth. Nothing less than that. That is a big ambition. And that is a big ambition that we are capable of being part of, especially at this university where the topic of food is present everywhere in so many of our educational programs, in so much of the work that our researchers and students are doing, and also in the context of a national law for universities and colleges, which identifies not only research and education as core ambition, ambitions that the government has for us, but also that we contribute to the development of a sustainable society. For that reason, I think that it's uh, natural that in this particular visit of yours to Norway that you uh, include time at a university. There's no question that uh, the business we're in is the business of discovery. We're in the business of discovering new knowledge previously unknown. That's the result of research. We're in the business of creating the opportunity for discovery for individual students, they themselves learning about things that they have not known before. Our commitment to working on food, to climate, on climate and on conflict is uh, not only deep, but it's very wide. And uh, one time I uh, had the opportunity to ask the Dean of our College of Business what the advantage is that he sees to run a College of Business at NMBU. And he said, it's the opportunity to work with our veterinarians, the opportunity to work with uh, people who work on agriculture. And, and for that reason, I say that this commitment is not only deep, and but also wide. We care about the effects of climate change on plant life, on animal life, and in turn, uh, what that means for the supply of food to humans. Of course, we don't want to do our work in isolation. It's extremely important to us that we find ways to take new knowledge produced here or discovered here uh, and communicate that new knowledge with policymakers. And our commitment uh, to public communication is no less for exactly that reason. 
we want policy to be formed on the basis of knowledge. We want policy to be formed on the basis of research and results. And for that reason, it's right of us to use significant resources, not only to produce that knowledge, but to, uh, to, to communicate it and to those who are uh, working in policymaking uh, fields. We experience here at NMBU that we have very good relations with parts of the government, and we're very happy about that. And we're working constantly uh, to develop uh, even stronger relations uh, to some of the areas of government that we don't have uh, so much traditional interaction with, but where we believe that we have important things uh, to offer. The topic of uh, self-sufficiency is an important uh, topic and is particularly present because of the government that we have uh, today, where the center party uh, has that as a really uh, front and center issue. And that's good for NMBU in many ways, <clears throat> although sometimes I get concerned that uh, the, there's a discussion about self, uh, self-sufficiency <clears throat> with respect to food that can at times border on discussions having a flare of protectionism around them. And I think finding the balance between uh, turning inward and continuing to um, cooperate uh, with the rest of the world is especially important. It goes without saying that all of these issues are especially uh, in the fronts of our minds these days because of uh, the war in, in Ukraine. And the effects of that war have been uh, massive as I'm sure we'll be talking about more later. Uh, when it comes to the supply of food. It's also been massive for Norway, not with respect to the supply of food, but because Norway has uh, is experiencing um, un, unearned windfalls, economic windfalls because of the war. You might be tempted to note that the war in Ukraine on the one hand uh, causes problems for the supply of food to significant parts uh, of the world. And on the other hand, uh, causes uh, massive economic windfalls for other countries, especially Norway. And you might be tempted to ask yourself, should those things be uh, seen in one particular context? Is there an ethical requirement for Norway uh, to look at its ill-gotten gains and ask what is its duty with respect to countries that have been affected in other ways and uh, by this war? That discussion is present politically, but it's not an easy one. It's not easy uh, for uh, the European Union to uh, properly engage Norway in these particular uh, discussions. And it's a difficult, difficult topic. So it's it's not surprising that it's hard. It's, it's a really, it's a tough nut to crack. And, but it seems to me uh, from my particular position that and there's really no question that the the the, the windfall uh, of war that Norway experiences uh, has to be um, uh, reviewed in that particular context. It's cold outside today, and it's uh, you know winter is coming, as they say, and this winter is going to be an awful winter when it comes to uh, food security. Thousands and thousands of people are going to die in Ukraine uh, of cold and hunger. Soldiers are going to die as this general population is going to experience uh, loss of energy, for example, that's going to lead to true crisis. If we go beyond thinking about Ukraine and add to that, for example, um, the situation in Afghanistan, we understand that the need to have food security as a very, very, very important point on the inter international policy agenda, and to ask ourselves deeply what our ethical duties are, but also what kinds of solutions the knowledge that we generate can lead to. We understand by reviewing those cases, uh, the extreme importance of this. We're committed to working on this in many different ways. And part of the ways that we do that is by creating debate and dialogue. And this uh, seminar is part of that uh, ambition. So uh, once again, let me welcome all of you to this event today and especially to you, Dr. Fallman. Thank you. Thank you, Rector. Um, so now we're going to move on to the keynote speaker here today, uh, Dr. Kerry Fowler. He's one of those persons that are very difficult to sort of introduce in, in a brief uh, way, uh, but, but I will try. 
Kari Fowler was a professor and head of research at Nuragrik uh, here at NMBU for a number of years. Uh, he also has had and have numerous affiliations with other uh, universities. He was the executive um, director of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, hosted at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN uh, in Rome for several years, where he oversaw the establishment of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. And then fast forward, in May this year, uh, Kari Fowler was appointed um, the US Special Envoy for Global Food Security. And in the press statement from Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, on the occasion of his, on the, on his appointment, uh, that statement said, the mission of the Special Envoy is to advance US food security global hunger and nutrition objectives through diplomatic engagement with allies and partners in bilateral, regional, and multilateral fora. So we are honored and thrilled to have you here with us to talk about this mission uh, and your vision in that regard, Carrie. Carrie, the stage is yours. So, um, yeah, long put for Yimlan Ambit. I'm very far from my homeland, but um, but this is very much home for me too. Uh, some of my oldest and dearest friends in my life, and some of the people who have um, been the most important to me in my life, are are here in this room. Um, Meta, of course. Um, my dear friend, Trigva, who's sitting next to you, whose walk, office I walked through every day when I was uh, um, on the faculty here. Um, Olsman, um, one of my dearest friends, one of the smartest people I've ever known. And, uh, and three of my bosses have turned up today, um, back at the scene of the crime, so to speak. <laughs> Steinbia, who um, recruited me to Nora Greek, uh, Tour Larsen, Ritaug, um, so many other um, really wonderful, wonderful friends. I see co-authors, Tura, um, um, Ingrid, who's here somewhere now. There she is up there. Just, just many, many people. This is a, this is an occasion that will, for me in my life, will never be repeated. So um, I'm, I'm deeply grateful and, and humbled by this. Um, Jennifer, thank you for the formal invitation. May I embarrass you by saying that you were a student of mine <laughs> here? Um, and Ola, um, there can be no greater honor for me than to be introduced by you, really. Um, so let me get into it. Uh, uh, years ago, um, years ago, I attended a lecture by a man named Jack Harlan. Uh, Jack was, I think at the time, he was the president of the um, Crop Science Society of, of America. Uh, he was a geneticist. He was an agricultural historian. Uh, he was a sorghum expert, uh, an avid sailor. He was, he was a remarkable person. This lecture was called Self-Perception and the Origins of Agriculture. And his point was that how you perceive or what, how you think agriculture started 12, 13,000 years ago really had a lot to do with who you were, uh, which, with uh, which perch you, uh, uh, you sat on in life. Um, so if you were in the old days, if you were an academic, you might be tempted to think, well, Agriculture must have been invented by some particularly clever person and then taught to everyone else, right? And if you were religiously inclined, you would think, well, agriculture must be a gift from the gods and so on and so forth. Um, well, likewise today, I think that, that how you view the current global food crisis really has, um, and, and certainly, what solutions you think there are to the global food crisis, they have a lot to do with the perch that you sit on in life. Um, I, um, 
there's an old American saying, I think most of you are familiar with it, that if your only tool is a hammer, all of your problems will appear to be nails. I'm sort of, I can be as myopic as anyone. I can tend to think that my analysis um, is probably the only one and that my solution is the most critical one. But in the current situation, I also realize that the global food crisis is really multi-causal. Um, we all know what the main causes are. They've already been mentioned. Um, climate change, COVID, conflict, 60% of the people who are food insecure in the world today are living in countries that are experiencing active conflict. Um, but there are other factors. There are high energy costs, uh, uh, costs now, which have an impact on fertilizer prices. And, and at least for two of the fertilizers, uh, three, two of the three important categories, um, they're in a kind of a price cycle. They're mined fertilizers, and we're at that point in the price cycle where the prices would normally be, be high. So all of these things are have come together currently to cause the, the food crisis that we're in today. And even though we and our politicians want this food crisis to be over as fast as possible, and I must admit I get asked questions about, well, how long will this last? Um, my answer is, is always, well, to tick off all the causes behind the food crisis and, and to throw the question back to the person to say, well, how long do you think these causes will last? Because that's how long the food crisis is going to last. So if we're really going to deal with the current global food crisis, which, by the way, existed before it hit the newspapers and therefore before February 24th when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, we have to ask ourselves, well, how long is climate change going to have the kind of impact it's having? How long are we going to be in wars? Um, how long is the price of natural gas going to be so high that it affects nitrogen fertilizer prices, um, et cetera, et cetera? Um, to me, climate change um, changes everything in terms of agriculture. Um, I. I go regularly to the website of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, NOAA.gov. And I'll tell you that October, which is the last month for which we have good statistics, November will come in in a couple of days. October was the 454th consecutive month in which the global average temperature for the month, October in this case, exceeded the 20th century average for that month. Think about that, 454 consecutive months of, quote unquote, above average temperatures. Anybody want to bet about what November is going to come in as, 455 perhaps? Of course. It was the fourth warmest in 143 years of temperature um, calculations. It was the uh, warmest in Europe. It was the third warmest in Africa. It was the sixth warmest in Asia. Of course, you know, higher, higher average temperatures are just one, one factor. Uh, we're experiencing more extremes, higher extremes, longer periods of extreme weather. We're experiencing hot weather when it really makes a difference in the plant cycle, such as when the flowers are blooming and, the, and pollination is going on and hot weather will, uh, will sterilize the pollen. We're also beginning to experience something that I think is, is going to be really interesting and where we're going to be getting some surprises, um, unfortunately, most of them bad, which is that we see species uh, beginning to migrate and their natural range changing and expanding. And what that's going to do and is doing is it's throwing together unique combinations of species, species that didn't live together before. And that's invading, if you will, our agricultural system. So our crop plants are in the future going to be growing amidst new combinations of species. And there will be, you know, some some surprises. I told Ola that I would forget to advance the slides and already I've done that. Um, so let me show you this histogram of Zambia. This is using some uh, fairly conservative, what would now be thought of as conservative climate models. 
And the blue bars will show the distribution of summer of average temperatures in different numbers of summers in the past in Zambia, in this case, 1900 to 2016. And you'll see at the very top, the highest bar is, is the sort of the average temperature of the whole of the whole period. And there were some summers, uh, if I can take a quick look here, what, about 23 or four um, uh, that were of a slightly cooler temperature. And there were some summers around what, 27 or eight that were, were a bit, bit hotter. The red bars indicate the projections in the future. Um, what you will see then, and I don't think the year, you know, years 2040 to 2060. And I, I just wanna draw your attention to one part of this graph and it's the part in the middle. Because what that's showing you is that in the future, the best, i.e. coolest growing seasons will be as hot or hotter than the hottest of the past. Let that sink in. The best seasons in the future will be the same as or worse than the worst of the past. This is not cherry picked. I didn't just pick Zambia to make a point. Um, almost all the countries would really look the same. Here's South Africa and Peru, and there you see even less overlap. Now, you know what happens in agricultural systems and with food security during the really hot growing seasons. We've had crop failures, famine, et cetera. Those are going to be pretty good growing seasons in the future if the climate models are correct. And by the way, the climate models at least NOAA and NASA have been upgrading them so that they're thinking that the kind of effects that we anticipated coming by 2050 will be here by, by 2030. Now, some people would like to, you know, look into the rear view mirror of the car in order to determine where the car is going. Probably not a good strategy if you're driving a car, but that's sort of the way that a lot of people look at food security and they take a look at previous food production and they say, well, you know, food production has increased a certain amount uh, over the years in a fairly steady pattern. So they project that forward and they say, well, since it's increased this amount in the past, it's going to keep on increasing that amount. And you'll see those sometimes often in the same article with that um, will predict how much food we're going to need to produce in the future. So you'll see projections that, well, by 2050, we're going to have to produce 50% more food, just to pick a number. And in the same article, you'll see the projection, well, we probably will produce 50% more food. But in, then if you look at the footnotes, you see something rather different. The message will be, well, this projection of how much food we're going to produce in the future doesn't take into account climate change, or inflation, or conflict, or all kinds of other things. In other words, all the stuff that's really happening in the real world. Then if you look at the climatologist and the agronomist who are working with the climatologist, you take a, a major crop such as maize, the, the predominant staple in Southern Africa, and you don't see projections in Southern Africa of a 50% of a increase in maize production in the future, in a climate changing world, you see a, you see a projection of a 20% or more decrease in production, which is a good bit distant from 50% increase. Um, so the assumption that um, crop production is going to simply continue its historic upward march, I think is an assumption that's, that's outlived its usefulness. So I wanna to talk to you today really about um, two, two issues that are of particular concern to my office at the State Department. Um, we, um, it's my personality to, to try to focus. Um, and so we're focused on two particular issues. And one uh, is in some ways above the ground and the other is below the ground. I'll, start with the below the ground issue that we want to work on. Um, already a, a great deal of the world's cropland 
soils are degraded. Um, most soils around the world have lost something between 25 and 75% of their carbon pool. African soils are particularly degraded. The organic content in a lot of African soils, 0.1%, maybe 0.2%. In the United States in the Corn Belt, 2 to 4%, 20 to 40 times as much organic content. Um, extreme climate events are going to cause more and more uh, crop erosion around the world. The, the estimate is 14% globally and 38% in Africa. The uh, Rattan Law, who is the uh, World Food Prize laureate to soil scientist, says that there's, there's no life without soil and there's no soil without life. That uh, soil is where actually where death becomes life. So without fertile soils, there's really no such thing as food security. Fertilizers alone are not the solution to this problem. Um, case in point, there's a long standing, I think the oldest, longest running experiment um, in, in the continent of Africa. It's been going on for 60 years uh, with many replications, one plot using only chemical fertilizers, one using only organic fertilizers, manure, one with crop rotations, some with various combinations and such. After 60 years, which is the plot that is in the worst shape and yielding the least? It's the one with only chemical fertilizers. Obviously, we need to increase the organic content of soils and nothing we can do, frankly, in terms of fertilizers or modern varieties is going to solve the problem if we can't do something with, um, with the basic quality of the soil. So even though I'm not a soil scientist, it seems pretty clear to me that there's a basic rule when it comes to soil, and that is that you have to replace the nutrients that you take out. <laughs> it's like a bank account. Um, uh, Charles Darwin, by the way, was the one that figured out um, how um, crop residues are incorporated into the soil and experiments that he did with earthworms. The last book that he wrote in his life was The Formation of Vegetable Mold um, uh, Through the Action of Worms. That book, by the way, outsold in its first year, Origin of Species. Um, it was a rather popular book at the time. Um, we need to make life good and healthy for earthworms on the, the world again. Um, the second, um, ah, you see, I'm, I'm still behind on the, uh, this obviously il illustrated the below ground <laughs> situation. Now I will try to catch up um, and talk about, yes, above ground. <laughs> um, above ground, the big preoccupation that I have is the question of whether our crops are or will be adapted to the climate change that we're experiencing and are about to experience. So the question is, should we worry about wheat and rice and maize, soybeans and their adaptation to climates? I think, yes, absolutely, we should be worried about those. But, but these are the crops that are attracting and have attracted in over decades, the most amount of our research dollars. So there's more money going, there's more money being invested in those crops than any other crops. If any crops are going to be adapted to climate change, it would have to be those because we're putting our money into those. So in a sense, I'm more worried about all of the other crops, all of the other crops other than the top four or five, because if you were to look at the investments being made in crop breeding and adaptation, it just falls off of a cliff after the top five. Uh, so I'm worried about the not so minor, minor crops. And that's basically everything but the top five. We can call them orphan crops in a sense because they're, they're like human orphans. They haven't had as much invested in them as they ought to have had. Um, but they have great potential. And that means the roots and tubers, that means the African uh, indigenous vegetables, that means uh, 
minor millets and teff, um, African leafy greens, grass pea, it means a lot of these kinds of things. Um, I'll often give the example of, of yams, and I think it, it's, it's a great example that proves a point. The world produces about 40, almost 40 million metric tons of yams. That's a lot of yams every year. And most of those yams are produced in Africa. So from one standpoint, you can ask yourselves, how many people depend on yams? And the answer would be tens or maybe hundreds of millions of people. But I would invite you to consider the question from the opposite end. And that is, how many people do yams depend on? There are about six yam breeders in the world. So if we expect the hundreds of millions of people in the world that depend on yams to be food secure, then we have to be worried about how secure yams are. And they depend on about six people in terms of yam breeding. And that's for a fairly important crop. There are a number of crops for which there are no breeders at all. And you'd be surprised to know that perhaps half of the crops that have been domesticated in the world and entered into world commerce have never had a single Mendelian trained uh, breeder ever in the history of, of agriculture. Well, how do, how do crops adapt to climate change? How do they evolve? They are, our crops are domesticated crops and that word domesticated is key here. Um, it comes from Latin, domus, the home. These crops have entered into the home. And their evolution, um, their adaptation is really in our hands. Um, they adapt either by formal plant breeding or they adapt by natural selection, by farmers making these selections, acting upon the diversity that they have. Um, or or they don't adapt at all. Um, we, we might want to learn in a sense from, from um, history in the United States. The United States is a, is a country with no major indigenous crop. We're the native home of cranberries, Jerusalem artichokes, a few nuts and berries, not much else. So think about it this way. When wheat came from the Near East to the United States, when potatoes came northward from the Andes Mountain, when soybeans came from China, when sorghum came from Africa, et cetera, et cetera. Those crops hitting the shores of the United States experienced climate change. It was a shock for them. How did all those crops adapt to the United States, to the different environments in the United States? They adapted, um, well, the story, the mythology in the United States is, well, the pilgrims put seeds in their pockets and came over in the sailing ships. And that's part of the story, yes. The other part of the story is that the U.S. government in the 1800s acquired massive amounts of seed, diverse seed, and then distributed it through millions of sending out millions of boxes of seed every year to farmers in the 1800s for experimental purposes. Probably the biggest agricultural experiment in human history. And what did those farmers do? They tried the seed and they selected the seed varieties that worked. And if it worked, they saved their seeds and they replanted the next year. And that's how you have agriculture from all these different crops adapted to all the different environments um, in the United States. Um, today, of course, we have remarkable new technologies in two regards. We have climate modeling, um, that allows us to predict um, more precisely what's going to happen in the environment. And we have gene banks with a lot of diversity uh, and increasingly more and more information about that diversity. So it would make it possible, I invite you to think about, to pair those two things together and to provide farmers growing crops for which there, is, there are no plant breeders with the diversity from which to make selections a la the United States in the 1800s to adapt their crops to, uh, to climate change. In other words, to empower the farmers themselves to shape their own, their own destiny. Um, in this regard, um, let me say um, a couple of things about what the, the US government will be doing. 
um, through my office at the State Department, we we are going to catalyze a process uh, in the next two years. Uh, it's a three-step process. And the first step, working with partners, working with academics, um, many others, um, co-sponsored by FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, co-sponsored by the African Union. We'll be looking um, primarily at Africa and we'll be looking to identify the crops that are or could be most important for nutrition for Africa in the future. Um, it, it's remarkable to me that if you think about it, our agricultural systems aren't, aren't all designed for the purpose of providing good nutrition for people. They, to some extent, have seemed to have been designed to, to provide the most calories, but not necessarily the most complete nutrition. So we want to look at what are the crops most critical for nutrition uh, in the future. And then the second step will be to ask ourselves, well, how are those crops going to uh, be affected by climate change? Obviously, some of those crops are going to do, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure any of them will do better. Some will be, do worse than others. And you want to know how the most important crops for nutrition will fare in a climate changing world. Because if you don't have that information, you don't have the basis on which to make rational investments in agricultural development. I mean, think about it. How would you go about supporting rational, sustainable, agricultural development and food security if you were just taking a guess at how crops would be, important crops would be faring in a climate changing world. Uh, and then of course, the third, the third step is actually to adapt those crops to climate change. And that can be done through modern plant breeding and modern technologies, or it can be done, as I mentioned earlier, through uh, supplying farmers with diversity and allowing them to make selections themselves. Um, in um, I'll just I'll just close out with with one story if you if you will, and that's actually to go back in time uh, to a, a a really uh, special year in the past. I think if I were a time traveler, this is the year I would want to go back to. Uh, the year is 1859. In 1859, three absolutely remarkable things happened. Um, in a single year. Uh, the first, first happened here. Um, this is the first commercial oil well drilled. It was in a little town in Pennsylvania in the United States uh, called Titusville and a man named Edwin Drake drilled it. This basically started the petrochemical age and it also started the massive increase in CO2 being going out in, into the environment. The second thing that happened in the same year um, happened in this man's laboratory. This man is John Tyndall, and he was working in the UK. And in his laboratory in experimental conditions, he discovered that CO2 was a greenhouse gas, that CO2 trapped heat. So isn't it remarkable that in the same year that the first oil well was drilled, 1859, we also had the science being developed, which understood what the effects of that would be over time. And then the third thing that happened, of course, happened with this man, um, Charles Darwin. Um, the third thing points to the solution to the first two. <laughs> Um, Darwin, as you know, put a number of things that were percolating around in the air together. There were really four separate steps. Darwin understood that there was diversity. He understood that there was inheritance of that diversity, hard inheritance. He also said, understood that there was natural selection. You could select from that diversity through inheritance. And if you Combined all of those things, diversity, inheritance, and selection, over time, what did you have? You had adaptation, i.e. evolution. 
he was the one that put that all together. Famously, his friend Huxley, you know, upon reading um, the first draft of Origin of Species said, remarked, how incredibly stupid of me not to have thought of that. Um, in hindsight, it was pretty obvious at the time it, it wasn't. Um, I think to some extent that um, we have to learn from this history. Uh, bear in mind, by the way, that the first chapter of Darwin's famous book, Origin of Species, the first chapter was on domesticated species. Why? Because evolution in domesticated species, in his case, dogs and pigeons and plants, was the most obvious uh, to him that there was evolution. We need to learn from that um, and perhaps shape our programs around that knowledge. So I, I want to end with um, quoting what I think is, is really one of the most beautiful and moving pieces in scientific literature ever written. Uh, it's the last paragraph of Origin of Species. Here's Darwin speaking. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So my friends, um, I would submit to you that this is what we need to keep alive if we hope to have food security in a climate changing world. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, inspiring as as always. That was uh, wonderful. The U.S. government uh, launched a food security strategy earlier this year. The Norwegian government launched its food security strategy just last week. Um, and our next speaker now, um, I will provide some comments, I guess, to to what you said, but also. Uh, talk a little bit about this strategy uh, is Lisa Albregsen. Lisa Albregsen uh, is the Norwegian Special Envoy for Climate Adaptation and Food Security, working then with the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Lisa is uh, no stranger to, to the university. You have a, a master's degree from, I read, I read up, a master's degree in environmental change and management from Oxford. You have a, a, a master's degree also in environmental economics from Milan. And you have a PhD on a highly food security relevant topic also from Oxford. Uh, Lisa, we're really looking forward to hear from you as well. Great, thank you very much, Ulla. And thank you very much for inviting me here. It's such a pleasure and an honor to listen to Carrie. We spent Friday together, which I really enjoyed. And now I have the opportunity to inform you a little bit about the Norwegian strategy, the new Norwegian strategy for food security in our development policy. I will mainly discuss that, and then we can comment a bit on what Carrie said maybe a bit later in the discussion. So um, times of crisis requires new thinking. Times of crisis also requires mobilization. The world we live in today, like the rector said, quite right, rightly is not the world we expected to live in just a year ago. The pandemic and also Russia's war of aggression against the Ukraine has created a new reality that we need to take in and we need to get to grips with. We now know how things are very much connected and how dependent we are on each other. It is said that we today produce enough food for the world uh, and for all the people that live here, but millions are food insecure due to distribution, poverty, and inequality. And we are witnessing that more and more individuals are unable to get enough food on a daily basis. Hunger is unacceptable and it is unnecessary, but it is a reality. Norway's Minister of International Development, Minister Twinereim, 
is very clear in her statements on this matter. She often underlines that it's fundamentally wrong that the small scale producers of food in Africa are unable to feed themselves and their families. It is also fundamentally wrong that Africa as a continent imports food for billions of dollars that it could produce itself. To address this, Minister Twinarim has launched recently, six days ago actually, a new Norwegian strategy for food security in our development policy called um, Kraftsamling Mutsvolt, which is the Norwegian version. We don't have the English name yet, and uh, we very much appreciate um, any suggestions as to Kraftsamling. How do we actually translate that word? The strategy gives us a new political direction for how Norway should work on food security in our development policy. We shall contribute to increase local and national food security by investing in small scale food producers. The value creation of products must take place locally so that both the surplus can reach local markets and the production, oh, sorry, so that the surplus can reach local markets. The production must be sustainable and more robust in the face of extreme weather events and other climate um, consequences. We have four main priorities in the strategy. It is productivity and production losses, value chain and markets, malnutrition and undernutrition, and the prevention and integrated response for food security. As you might have noticed, the government has increased the funds available for food security in our development policy work, and is also planning to upkeep that level next year. I just want to shortly outline five aspects from the strategy that are quite new to this strategy. We had an action plan that was launched in 2019, and this is a little bit of a, um, a change of direction in this new strategy. We are establishing five priority countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Ghana and in Mozambique, we are already working on aquatic food. In Malawi, Tanzania, and also in Mozambique, we are already contributing to the agricultural sector and to value chain development. And in South Sudan, a country in conflict and which struggles with climate change, we work in a comprehensive effort where humanitarian support and long-term development uh, work within the food security realm are linked. Secondly, we gather and draw more systematically on Norwegian expertise. Among other things, we will strengthen the Agriculture for Development program, which is under the Knowledge Bank in Norad. Now, the Agriculture for Development program has gradually started and will be formally launched early next year. And since I'm being here at OS, I also need to uh, acknowledge and recognize that the Norwegian Veterinary Institute, which is just next door, is one of the first institutions engaged in the Agriculture for Development program. Through this knowledge program, program, we will also include the establishment of cooperatives and producer organizations, again, drawing on Norwegian expertise. I also want to reference just what Kurt said earlier in his opening remarks. I have greatly, greatly valued the, the relationship and collaborations I've had with Ola Vestingen, with Ruth Hoog here at the university, and that has really um, provided me with a lot of insight into how, how important research is for policy development. And I want to acknowledge that since I'm here today. Uh, thirdly, we will strengthen civil society and private sector's opportunity to follow up. For civil society, we are establishing a call um, for proposals uh, that will be published on Nora's website very shortly. We're just finalizing the translation uh, of the new strategy. And as soon as that's done, the call will be out. For the private sector, we are considering various risk reduction mechanisms and also looking into a separate announcement for the private sector. Fourth, we are setting up some funds or we're setting aside some funds so that we can react quickly when there is a hunger crisis looming. Now, most hunger crises are known. It doesn't happen in a spur of the moment. It's very, it happens over a long time. And we want to try to prevent an event those those most um, the worst peaks by having some funds that are not humanitarian but they are development funding that we can come in provide seeds provide feed uh, for the animals etc. 
these fundings, these funds are not humanitarian, as I said, but they are development funds, and it's under the Minister of Development, uh, Development's budget. Now, fifth, we are also gathering the responsibility for all the UN organizations working on food security for a comprehensive effort. That means that we have the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, and the World Food Program, WFP, under the responsibility of the Minister of Development within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In seven years, we will settle the status of the 2030 Agenda. We will not achieve the global goals um, without fighting hunger, first and foremost. In less than a generation, we will need to feed and employ almost 10 billion people globally. We cannot do that without increased production and increased value creation in food producing sectors. No field in development is more important. Therefore, Norway is now making a concerted effort against hunger through our new food security policy. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. We uh, should have had some copies of that uh, strategy here in in, in the Norsk, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you got five. Yeah, yeah, and it is available. Yeah, there there are a few. So yeah. Um, yes. Um, our next speaker out, and uh, you know, there's only one speaker left now. <laughs> is uh, our very own Jennifer West. Uh, she's an environmental social scientist. Um, she has a master and a PhD from Nuragrik, this very this proud institution. Uh, and after some years at CICERO, she returned to us uh, at uh, Nuragrik and she's now our head of department. Um, so I invite you now, Jennifer, to say a few words. These are the slides you didn't show, Karen. Well, thank you, Ula. And um, yes, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be able to say a few words on behalf of Nuragrik. Uh, and as already mentioned, the strong connection uh, with Kerry from his role at Nuragrik um, and many others working on food security. So I'm going to just say a very few words about the department and some of the um, throw out some some words of um, to get us started in, in the panel debate, maybe on some of the solutions that we can discuss. So Nudagrik is one of five departments at Lansong, which is the social science faculty here at NMBU. Uh, we were originally formed actually as a, a kind of center uh, uh, by Nurad back before 1986. Uh, and the original name was uh, was very much focused on uh, international agricultural development. Uh, and we were incorporated then under NMBU in 2005 as a department. I won't go on about our history. There's a, there have been a number of changes over the years, but the, the, the roots that we have in agricultural development and in giving advice uh, on these very important questions goes back to our start. So we have about 30 permanent staff and a number of PhD, PhDs conducting uh, interdisciplinary research on both global uh, food systems, food insecurity, uh, and a number of other topics related to global development, international environment, and uh, international relations. And we have five st study programs, uh, including the master's and PhD programs that I was educated under and fortunate to study under Kerry for my master's. Uh, yeah, and about 150 undergraduate and graduate students. And I think what's unique maybe about Nuragrik is that it's maybe perhaps the most international department uh, at NMBU. Uh, it's English is our, uh, is our language, uh, is our, our main language. And uh, we have such a diversity of students and that has been one of the main attractions, I think also for me when I was a student, uh, first starting at Nuragrik. And this diversity is a very important uh, foundation, I would say for Nuragrik in all of our research and uh, teaching. So how can research and education contribute to sustainable food systems? Kurt has said a number of, uh, uh, I don't want to repeat what you have said, I support uh, all of the good points you made. 
Uh, but I think it's really in obviously providing independent critical research uh, on these very important questions. Uh, we work with many partners, with NGOs, with governments, uh, with private sector as well, but the independence and the ability to, and privilege to have that independence is very important. I would argue, um, as Carrie also argued, that in understanding, you know, the, the social and political and institutional dimensions, I think that shape food production and distribution systems, uh, this is something that has been core to many uh, uh, yeah, programs and, and undertakings at Nuragdik over the years. If you're looking at technology adoption or rejection when it comes to agriculture uh, by smallholder farmers, then you need to understand these contexts. Uh, and conducting research-based teaching, obviously, uh, is a very important aspect of quality uh, in our studies and in our research. So, you know, building on and harnessing uh, our global networks and the diversity in our student body, I would say are key aspects that we continue to value very highly. Nuragdik has a very long history of building institutional collaborations with universities in the South. Um, <clears throat> and this is something that is also a very big part of our identity <clears throat> and continues to guide uh, our strategies in our research and in our teaching. So just to give a few examples, um, Nuragdik and NMBU have been engaged in the Sahel since the mid 18, uh, 1980s. We are currently involved in large projects in Mali and Niger on agricultural development and food security. Um, yes, and also involved in helping to develop the Norwegian Sahel strategy. So in Mali, we have uh, reached more than 50,000 households with significant improvements in food security. Uh, another example in East Africa is our long collaboration with Lilongwe. Uh, University of Agriculture and Natural Resources, Luanad in Malawi, where we've been working uh, closely with our uh, partners there since 1997. Uh, we continue to do so under two large scale programs that are funded by the Norwegian Embassy. Uh, yes. So I think that also one of the main roles of research is to contribute to uh, the uptake of best practices to communicating this knowledge to policymakers and so on, as has already been mentioned. Uh, and this is important um, to connect these different fields. Yes, so that was, uh, yeah, some few words from me. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. I, now I actually would like to invite you back uh, up again because uh, we would like to have a bit of a panel discussion here. Um, so we didn't find tables, but we, <laughs> we, have, we have some chairs here. So I hope you can make yourself comfortable on those. Um, yeah, it's free seating, actually. But, uh, <laughs> So we um, can now take uh, questions here from the audience. Uh, we can also take uh, questions uh, online. I'm going to give you some uh, these. Uh, um, so think about questions. Um, but let me to start us off. Uh, I, I have a question. So, uh, well, and actually I'd like to say a little bit about the, this discussion as well. I think that uh, mm, I recommend that we, we focus now on these two strategies uh, of the two governments because it's so exciting what's, uh, what's coming out now, uh, but also this role of research and universities in relation to this agenda topic. So um, that's sort of a, a bit of a framing for, for, for this discussion here. But to get us started, I'd like to talk about power. And this is not only because I'm at Nuragrik, uh, and it's not only because uh, we have a superpower uh, in the room, um, but it's because I think this is a very important topic in the current uh, crisis. Um, there is really increasing concentration in almost all the value chains in the agri-food systems in the world, from inputs like seeds and fertilizers to 
the retail level. And we see this in most countries across the, across the world. Uh, and I think there are some huge paradoxes in the current crisis where we're seeing that some of the bigger actors, some of the bigger companies are making huge profits, while we at the same time see bread lines are growing longer and longer in countries all around the world, including in, in Norway. So, so I'd like to start with that, which is a really hard question i know but uh, and it's a question to to all of you actually um so how do your strategies address this inequality and in power and agency in the food systems and if so how um how can we address this important topic so i'd like to start harry with you if you don't mind well i um I told Ola before we started this presentation that um, that I was hoping to get an easy question from him. <laughs> and, and I reminded him that I represent a country with nuclear weapons. <laughs> but he obviously forgot that. <laughs> so um, I guess the quick answer is that um, that what I'm about to say isn't a solution to the problem because I think nothing that I could tell you about what the US government is doing or its strategy would convince you that, aha, they must have the solution and we're about to have the kind of equitable, progressive, um, food secure world we want to, want to live in. But we can hope to make some contributions, right? And, and um, that's where I can at least speak for my own office uh, in the State Department and saying that I think that the kind of program that I mentioned to you earlier is a step in that direction. Why? Because um, if we want to redress some of the power imbalances, we have to look at, um, and you want to do that through technical means and, and in the agricultural system, you have to you have to get yourself outside of the large commodity <coughs> crops. You have to get yourself outside of the maize, wheat, rice, soybeans. You have to get yourself into the space of the whole farming system and the kinds of crops that are grown by smallholder farmers. And that's really what my office and indeed the Agency for International Development are focused on. And we're focused in particular on the kind of crops that are um, predominantly grown by women. In, and certainly by smallholders, and very often even in household um, setting. If, if I look at the future, um, I see a, a future where climate change has a dramatic and negative effect on agricultural production, particularly for those quote unquote minor crops that are predominantly grown by women and smallholder right. farmers. Why? because we haven't been investing in those crops. Why haven't we been investing in those crops? That's a good question. Um, there may be some correlation there. So I think that if we want to begin to move the needle, needle and begin to turn the tide, we have to look at those parts of the farming system that um, where smallholders are operating and begin to give them some leverage uh, and the tools that they need to succeed. That's at least what I hope to contribute to in the next couple of years. Thank you. Great, thank you. It's a very difficult question, and I will I will try to sort of follow up on what Carrie said because, um, like the Norwegian strategy on food security cannot really deal with the question that you have mm -hmm. in a proper manner, and it, it's not it's not set out to do that, but it is supposed to do a little bit. It's supposed to do a little part to help empower the small scale food producers, for example. Um, seeds, of course, very important. And we're working on seeds, as you know very well, Ola. We have been collaborating with the university and with Ola um, and with others on, on establishing, or trying to establish uh, a way of, of putting the farmer first in seed systems. And this is the work that is going to continue. And it's specifically mentioned in the strategy, actually. Because it is so important. We did this in relation to the Food Systems Summit as a good, we was, well, it was a, um, a big solution, um, a scalable solution that we wanted to present to the, uh, the UN 
And we work together here in Norway also with the Ministry of Agriculture and Food on this solution. And it's something that we want to bring forward. That is one example in a way of ensuring that we bring some agency, help people uh, on the ground. And through that, hopefully, we can support them in getting more empowered than they are today. Thank you. I'd love to hear also from the university diplomats here. Yeah. Well, I think it's um, wonderful to ask a question about power and balances of power at an institution of higher education, because there's no doubt that education is one of the key tools that we as a society have available and to to level out power, to 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 acknowledge the role that knowledge has as a as a power equalizer. Carrie, I have to um, tell you, I was a little bit surprised about your comment regarding 1859. Because there was one very important thing that happened that year that you didn't mention. And that is that uh, this institution admitted its very first students. <laughs> <clears throat> so it was a landmark year in the, in the, in the history of the world. And uh, I, I often uh, mentioned Darwin and then the creation of the institution who would provide such insight into that. But I do have to say that um, that if we in Norway want to be serious about using knowledge as an equalizer in these kinds of contexts, one of the most important things we can do is uh, strengthen our commitment, not only to um, educating Norwegian students, but to educating students from all over the world. And our go current government has made a tragic decision uh, in that regard that's manifest in the last budget, whereby we've made a decision to abandon the principle of free higher education and start charging tuition uh, to the to the least able of the students that come here. And I would like to publicly call on the government to reverse uh, that decision and to use the tools that we have in the sector for higher education in Norway uh, to continue contributing to the equalization of food security, among other things, through uh, education of not just our country, but our world. Thank you. Um, maybe I can say a little bit from a research perspective in terms of the role of research in, in sort of illuminating some of these political dimensions. I think that's a clear responsibility that we have as researchers um, committed to social justice and, and development. Um, and I think that the kind, that's exactly the kind of aspect that you, you often find when you start to look critically into particular contexts where uh, agricultural production takes place, where policies are being implemented or not implemented. Um, the politics of uh, climate adaptation, for example, where we have researchers at NMBU doing a lot of uh, yeah, very good research. Um, the politics of development interventions, we need to be aware that actually uh, the interventions that we make can sometimes do harm and, and try to avoid that. Um, who wins and loses from particular interventions? These are the kinds of key questions that I think research at NMBU can contribute to. Thank you. And um, now we open up for questions from the floor. There, at, the mic is already with Ruth, so we're starting there. And then I see hands. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks uh, to the panel. Excellent presentations. And Kerry, it's so nice to have you back here with us. I don't know why we let you go, but uh, <laughs> I guess you wanted to save the world. And uh, and this was also was maybe not the best place to do that. But uh, you, you really have had a wonderful impact in so many ways. Um, but but I, I want to challenge you a bit, and, and it goes to the whole panel. Um, you know, in all this international meeting you and I have been, the question has always been, so what's the relationship between production and, and food security? I mean, how can food availability really ensure food security when it comes to access, which is the definition of, of food security? So... Uh, when you spoke, I mean, I couldn't agree more about the soil health and, and uh, agrodiversity, but still, I mean, 
what do we do to make sure that the structural injustice, I mean, we have enough food in the world today. Maybe not we will have that next year or the year after, but up to now, it's enough food, but still so many people are going hungry. So what do you do with that? For example, I'm just back from Malawi and the farmers are so poor, they can't even afford to keep their land. They rent it out or they sell it because uh, um, they are just so hungry. They don't know uh, how to get the next meal. So, so still, I mean, how do we crack that access part of the food security? And it goes to, to the, the whole panel because I think we have talked about it for so many years and it's so difficult. And, and of course we need more, more research to look into these things. And, and we are doing that here at, at the university. And, and that goes to the next um, university collaboration. And Kurt, I'm so proud of you as a rector when, it, when I see how you have fought for Norway being the country in the world, not having tuition. Uh, I'm so sorry you have lost, but <laughs> at least you stood in that fight. And I would like to take that opportunity to, to thank you because I think the institutional collaboration we've had for so many years, 50 years, uh, started with Mark Herrera. Uh, it has, has really made a difference in so many ways, not at least for us, but I think also when I see all this students that we we have had i mean they go back they they do make a big difference in in their countries i see now ula gets a bit worried when is ruth going to stop <laughs> you should have given me the mic but, uh, <laughs> not at somebody all. else would it, like uh, it more pass it down there but um i think if there was a question there to you carrie um you can start with the access question well i I knew after Ola asked his question that there was at least one more difficult question coming because Ruth had not gotten the microphone yet. <laughs> so so um, I, I don't have an answer, Ruth, that will please you very much, I guess. Um, I just don't know the answer to that question. I, I do tend to think that, um, that the current situation is teaching us something. And that is that some of the um, old paradigms that we were very comfortable living in uh, may need some questioning. And for a long time, we were thinking that, well, is, is, the, is the food problem an access problem? Is it a distribution problem? Is it a production problem? And uh, for a long time, I think those of most of us in this room would have thought it's an, it's an access or distribution problem, not a production problem. I think that in an era of climate change, we, we might want to rethink that a little bit. Um, we're, we're looking at, um, we, we're already in the fourth uh, unprecedented year of, of drought in the Horn of Africa. We're headed toward the fifth year, which builds on that unprecedented uh, record. It's, um, it's obviously a, um, many things in the Horn of Africa, but production is one of them because of that that drought. So I think we have to be um, open-minded about that. And I, I suppose the other thing is that, um, and, and here's where I, I give you a more personal answer to the question, which is that um, uh, I've realized at this point in my life, obviously, um, I'm not looking at a future job beyond the one that I have now. And um, and as a political appointee, I, I serve at the pleasure of the president. And so I better get something done quickly. Um, I, I think you need to focus. I think you need to focus on what you're best at and what, what you can do something about. And what you can't do anything about is the entire food system. <laughs> you have to sort of pick your battles. And, um, and I'm very pragmatic, and I suppose the two things that jump out to me are what where where I start from is what what is everybody else overlooking? What are we missing? Um, i I look at human history, and i I think that where human beings go wrong is is not in the planning stage. We're really good at planning. 
we're even really good at implementing. What, where we go wrong is with assumptions. We, we base our plans very often on poor assumptions. Um, most dramatically recently, Vladimir Putin made a very poor assumption invading the Ukraine, thinking he would march to Kiev in, what, three days, four days? Didn't quite work out that way. And sometimes I think we make poor assumptions. And, and the work that I described to you that we want to catalyze at the State Department is based on overcoming one of those assumptions. And the assumption is that our agricultural crops will be adapted to climate change magically without our really doing anything or investing in them. I think that's a pretty poor assumption. And if, if that assumption is incorrect, which I'm convinced it's incorrect, then my gosh, all that list of crops other than the top four or five are going to be in deep trouble. And I invite all of you to think about what life would be like if all of those minor crops don't adapt minor crops, potatoes, sweet potatoes, millet, sorghum, yams, the whole range of them don't quite do so well in a climate changed environment. And who's that going to impact? Who's that really going to impact? It's going to be the people we care about. And that's going to be the access problem um, because we in the global north will outbid them for those for those supplies so i think we we have to we have to do that uh, we have to look at crop adaptation to climate change we have to look at the underlying soil that's going to support that and that's that's why i'm i'm trying at least uh, at the state department to get us to think about those underlying assumptions uh, that I, I believe are are dangerous at this point sorry for taking hmm. so long yeah, to answer very good do, do you want to comment on that as well, Lisa? Or, yeah. Quickly, also just echo what Kerry said. I don't have the right answer either. It is a very difficult question, but I, I think we'd be very interested to see that research that you're doing because it is very. I think it's very based on situation very locally. It's based on a national situation, even sometimes regional situation. So I think the research that is being done here on the issue of access would be very interesting for us at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to actually understand a bit better. So I invite you to come and, and brief us on that. Thank you. Hmm. Do you want to comment, Kurt, on this, whether the battle is lost or not, or is it the... <laughs> yeah, so please. Okay, um, I'm Morten Lillemo. I'm a professor in plant breathing. For those who don't know me, I want to thank you, Carrie, for a very inspiring uh, talk today. And I really liked your plant breeding perspective and also your optimism about actually that it's possible to adapt crops to changing environments. I think we should uh, keep on with that. But I will have a question for you, actually, because I'm not sure if that is really the most important thing we should do. Of course, we should adapt our crop to the changing environment. And we know the genetics, we have the genetics tool for that, but I think, uh, I'm not sure if that is actually the biggest issue. Uh, you also mentioned uh, the soil health and erosion and problems with actually with the productivity of the soil. Uh, I haven't traveled the world as much as you, but I know there are big problems with deforestation many places. And when you have then got rid or removed the vegetation, and then you have extreme weather events then you get problems with the soil erosion and also maybe more temperature extremes also when there is less vegetation. So maybe we should focus more on adapting the environment to the crops we're going to produce and have that focus instead, you know, uh, really focus on improving the soil, improving the cropping system. And, and in that way, uh, there will also be more room actually, I think for adapting the crops to the changing environment, because then the, the environment will not be so extreme anymore. So I just want your thoughts and comments on that. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's good to see you again. I um, Obviously, I have to agree that I wish we were doing a better job at mitigation <laughs> and that our adaptation challenge wouldn't be so extreme, but, um, but here we are. Um, <clears throat> I know that, um, the majority of countries in the world are net food importers. So there's a, we have very complex uh, global food system. And I, I think it pays us to be humble about this. I, I think that uh, in a sense, there are multiple diff different kinds of agricultural farming systems around the world. And 
you just have to hope that each one of them is as successful as it can be and has a, its own you know, evolutionary potential. One thing that strikes me is that um, up until the mid 1980s, the predominant way of, um, that we human beings were successful in producing more food every year was to expand cropland. That's where the largest incremental changes in food production came every year up until the mid 80s. And in the mid 80s, something quite dramatic in human history happened and it didn't make the front page of the newspaper, which was that for the first time in history, we actually produced more food, not by expanding cropland, but by intensifying production. This is sort of the red queen strategy, if you will, <laughs> um, uh, from Alice in Wonderland, where, um, you know, unfortunately here we are on the treadmill and we are running faster and faster just to stay in the same place. And that, but that is, that is where where we are. So I wouldn't want to argue that what um, what I mentioned earlier is the most important thing to do. Um, but I think it is an essential thing to do because I think that if our soils can't promote um, our crops, we're in trouble. And if our crops don't adapt to climate change, then neither will we. Um, but that still leaves plenty of room for other people to do other work, which I hope they're doing. Thank you. There are, I'm going to take two questions up there now, and then we'll see if there's some online. So yeah, please. Go. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Kari. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks also, of course, to, to Jennifer and Turk as well for their comments. Uh, my name is John Andrew McNeish. I'm a professor here at Norgrick, um, and I'm an anthropologist. So I come from a slightly different direction entirely. Um, my question to you is really, I mean, 1859 was mentioned. 1859 is not only connected to these very important people, but it's also the height of European colonial power at that age, right? So colonial power is something to remember here in the history, in the history of this uh, of scientific discovery, but also, of course, of manipulation of crops. And this should remind us perhaps also again of other aspects of power, right? We've already touched on power. And then this time, I really wanted just to ask you about trust. Why should we trust you? Why should we trust the United States and its strategy for, for food, uh, food security? Why should we trust Norway and its strategy for food security? Given the facts that that history are rather a dire history, a history of colonialism, um, where we can not only talk about uh, aspects of, of, of that colonial history, such as the Green Revolution and the way in which we, at the one, on the one hand, yes, we expanded a global yield of crops, but on the other hand, uh, there were terrible consequences as well for local communities uh, that were affected by those massive transformations of their landscapes and lands. We could also, you touched on, Carrie, you touched on, on uh, the global petrochemical industry. This has also led, of course, to the development of fantastic fertilizers, of which our, our global uh, and industrial food system uh, uh, really relies. But we also recognize that that's also connected to oil production and fossil fuel production and all of the, the CO2 emissions that are produced by that, by the, also by the, the contamination and the pollution that's also produced by those petrochemicals. We can also think about the advice that might come as well from governments such as your own about diet and food. America is, of course, well known for its fantastic diets. Uh, you know, uh, maybe you can't really lay the blame in the same way against Norway in that regard, but certainly who are we to believe here? Uh, you want to work with small farmers? You want to work with also, you know, of, of, you know, getting the trust of local people to be involved in your food strategies? How are you going to get them to be convinced, uh, given that history of colonialism? Would you have a suggestion for us? <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I can, I, I don't think I can answer for the entire history of the United States or our relations uh, abroad. I, I can answer for what we're trying to do now and trying to do in an honest and legitimate way and trying to do with partners and and I think trying to do on the basis of what we've learned uh, over time. 
Um, the work that I outlined for you today that, that we're engaged in, want to be a catalyst for, we're, we're doing um, in, in partnership with some of the people you mentioned. Um, and I guess um, I would ha have to say honestly that I can't think of anything better uh, for us to do in the current situation, in the current kind of climate um, and climate change atmosphere that we're, we're facing. Um, I simply can't think of anything better to do. If, if one wants to argue that because mistakes have been made in the past that therefore nothing you can do in the future would possibly be good or productive, well, then I guess we can go home. Um, but I'm not ready to do that. Uh, so I think that uh, we have to we have to move forward um, and and do the best we can. Is it gonna is it gonna be perfect? Probably not. Um, but I I think it's um, I, I guess I, we have to be willing to be in the game and trying as best we can, uh, despite the fact that we know that there will be. Um, ample opportunity for people who are not uh, in positions, uh, frankly, such as mine, that will be able to um, cast doubt and throw stones. But we, we, have to, we have to continue. Yes, I fully agree we have to continue. And, and we are not forcing anyone to participate and collaborate with us. We are Sort of extending in hand saying you know certain governments we would like to collaborate with you would you want to collaborate with us so i mean trust is definitely developed through conversation dialogue openness uh acceptance getting to know each other i mean there's a history yes of course there's a history but we also need to look forward uh and move ahead and i think um we see now with some of the countries that we want to partner with and work with they are very much interested in, in working with us um, so we're not forcing anyone, uh, we're not uh, telling them they have to trust us, but we want them to trust us. It's an open relationship. So, yeah. Um, maybe just in uh, response to John's question, I think this is something that I read as implicit in both the U S and the Norwegian strategies is, um, at least on paper, a commitment to involving smallholders in this discussion to valuing local knowledge to including it in these strategies. And I think those are very important counterpoints to the kinds of power and historical power um, aspects that you're raising, John. Thank you. There was another question, same row there. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep it a bit short. I am a master's student in the agroecology program and I'm interested in change processes in farm systems. Um, and that covers a wide variety of things that you've already spoken about, but specifically I'm interested in local knowledge and uh, yeah, safeguarding genetic diversity, uh, especially with regards to crops. Um, and my question is kind of regarding the role of universities and research in general, is how do we enable, um, I guess, more action-based research for the purpose of safeguarding these resources, because it seems that universities are well positioned to be able to both provide, uh, you know, work opportunities, but also research opportunities uh, in the context of uh, local food production systems. And I'm curious if NMBU has thought about that a bit further, rather than just, you know, setting up uh, test fields. How can we actually involve students, involve people uh, within rural communities and uh, both in Europe and abroad, in establishing more relevant uh, production methods uh, in the context of local knowledge. Does NMBU want to answer that? I can start anyway. <clears throat> I think this is um, a, a, a great comment. And um, one of the things that, um, you know, of course, the short answer to that is that we need to identify some set of appropriate uh, partners and engage in both collaboration on research as well as education with those partners. But in order to get to that stage, part of what we have to do is uh, liberate ourselves from the tyranny of excellence, which is uh, something that affects our sector where we're, we keep trying to climb the ladder of very um, 
of international rankings and of other kinds of things that don't reward us for working with institutions in the kinds of settings that are probably relevant uh, for your question. And I think that one of the most important things that we can do is to say that uh, we're not going to let a commercial organization in London or Shanghai decide whether we're a good university or not and set the criteria for that. We're going to make that decision ourselves. We're going to make that decision in the context of the political environment in which we find ourselves. And then we're going to choose our collaborators in situations where we think we have something to offer and where we think that they have something to offer us. And I think one of the, and with apologies for returning to this issue, but one of the greatest losses uh, of the of the tuition issue here this year is not uh, that students in the global south miss out on the opportunity to come to NMBU, but that students who are at NMBU miss out on the opportunity to have fellow students from the global south. And so we have to we have to realize that there is a genuine opportunity for exchange of knowledge with institutions that never will be on any kind of ranking that we'll never get a reward for in somebody else's uh, ranking their criteria and, and instead and instead choose those partners and uh, ourselves. If I may also just comment on that. Um, Jennifer mentioned that you get funding from the embassy in Lilongwe in Malawi. And uh, one of the things that we do in Malawi specifically is that there's a, a project being funded by the, by the embassy which is supporting NMBU working together with Norwegian civil society organizations. And this is actually taking research and applying it to, um, you know, what is happening in the field to help smallholder farmers to actually be able to access into the food, local food systems, supporting them using research and applying it directly with civil society actors. And I think that's a great example of showing that it's, it's relevant. It's, research is very relevant and it can be applied and it can be applied instantly. Yeah, and I guess I can just follow up saying that this is in a way the way we have always worked at Nuragdik. We have always collaborated with our partners in the South, with students and researchers from other universities. So to us, this is a kind of modus operandi, and we will continue to find ways to do that regardless of the tuition fee issue, but it will require creativity. Thank you. I think we're going to take one question from online now. So, Sarah, if you could... Uh... There's... um. Three questions, but I'll try. I'll I'll try and sort of summarize the different questions, and then they can kind of be answered uh, uh, together. So, um, one question from Martin Inderhaug about um, Carrie, your talk about the impact of climate change on food production. Um, so he asks, um, it seems like the projected decrease in agricultural yields are highest in regions with the highest projected population growth. So how do we solve that problem? And also would like to know whether um, warmer weather in, in cold climates could replace some of the loss in production in warmer areas. So that's one question. Um, Daniel, good. oh, well, so <laughs> I kind of combined. Uh, Daniel Van Yilst uh, from NORAD asks a question for Carrie and Lees. Um, how do you see um, Norway, how, how could we, Norway or the US, cooperate together in terms of some of the, the ways forward that you've outlined in your strategies? So, um, you know, carry the, uh, your proposals above ground and below ground. Um, how, who are the potential partners in that? Um, a little bit more on the ground. How do you see that actually being implemented? Um, and then there's also a question um, from Leta Mikal, who um, asks about um, to, how is the US department considering um, conflict and war, such as uh, the situation in Tigray in, in your work on food security? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, quite a few things. Um, first, I guess, I think it would be, um, um, I'm, I'm not counting on climate change um, resulting in more food production in the north to make up for what's in the south. Let's face it, um, you know, most of the food that's produced in the world, particularly in the developing world, is consumed locally. So it doesn't, uh, I, I wouldn't be terribly optimistic, uh, even if we were to increase production dramatically in the global north, that somehow that was 
that would be benefiting the global south. I think we, we have to be careful about what's being produced you know, um, on site. Um, what were your other questions? I got lost in that one. Okay. Um, there's also the questions about who do you see as being the partners? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I, I, my visit to Norway is have said at, at one level that, that Norway is a partner. At another level, um, you know, we, we also work through our missions in the field. Um, the comments that have been made today about Malawi resonate with me because we're, we're quite interested in working with, with the Malawians. Um, I think there's a lot of potential there. They think there's a lot of potential there. Um, we are active in those countries, and those uh, in Malawi is is a country where I will say that um, that has approached us. Um, this gets back to the question of trust, um, with help in some specific things. In this case, with with drought tolerant maize, of course. And the question for us, I suppose, you could say, well. well if you if you want our help with drought tolerant maize, should we say no because you don't trust us or shouldn't trust us or you say yes and will you trust us more? Either way, you know we. You can. But I I think a lot of our work um, needs to be with local partners. We're not an implementing agency ourselves, so we're talking about the the, the governments and their extension services, but. Increasingly, I think we're talking about NGOs, civil society, and working in these countries. Um, and increasingly with women's groups and youth groups to, to give them resources they don't have now that empowers them in the, in the system somehow. And uh, um, I'll just say um, to my friend Daniel, who I suppose is online there, and um, the bedroom, uh, Daniel, um, that um, that I, in, in this sense, I, I really see a lot of complementarity, uh, resonance, harmony between the, the Norwegian strategy as, as well I know it um, and, and our own. And that's, that's why, as I mentioned the other day, that, that the first country visit I'm making in, in my, my job was to Norway because I, I really felt that, um, that there would be a lot of harmony and, and um, camaraderie and and a sense that we're on the same page with with how we want to approach these things so um so yes at the top levels we want to work with norway and others like that um down at the ground level we want to work with ngos and different groups great thank you uh yes uh we had some great conversations with carrie on friday we will continue uh, Daniel, we are planning to, to extend our collaborations with the U.S. We just need to find the right way. And I should also mention we are already working with the U.S. government uh, on several different um, projects and initiatives. And the latest one we just launched during COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, which is the Global Fertilizer Challenge. We've been collaborating very closely with the State Department in developing and expanding the scope of that um, initiative. And uh, we are in the final phases of deciding how we're going to spend our funding related to that. So uh, there is great collaborations and it will continue. Thank you. Thank you. One, okay, two questions I hear. So uh, please, Osman, first. Yes. <clears throat> um, my name is Osman Bjornstein, Professor Emeritus of Tom Breeden. Thank you very much, Carrie, for the, for the introduction. And I maybe, uh, uh, a little bit more on the possibilities as seen from the plant breeder perspective. If you think of the, you started very early on with, uh, with the early agriculture. Let's say it's starting in the closest one, starting in the Middle East. And wheat starting in the Middle East or in say, Iran, uh, that, that, that currently yields mo most in New Zealand, which has the world record. It's grown in 188 countries. It has gone through a tremendous climatic adaptation. And when it came to the United States, for instance, it suffered for several centuries until in the mid 18th, mid 18th, well, to be precise, 1842 and 1875, there were spring wheats and winter wheats introduced from Crimea and Southern Russia, which fits just like a blueprint in, 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 the, in the Great Plains. So 
with and with that suddenly there was a, uh, the the north american production because you found the the adaptation fitting the uh, and you're sort of coming from a right climate into the same climate but after that they the the, the it the winter wheat expanded so much you know that now it's far far north in canada in environments where it's never where it was never adapted in the first place so so there is a big potential and um, just for to end off here with with a similar thing uh, uh, um, stemming from from research here in the university and it is also with, uh, relates to Degray, where where uh, where barley is a minor crop or small relatively small crop uh, and uh, uh, or at least in ethiopia it is and uh, and um, by very simple crossings done here we could see actually in the in, in, and picked up by farmers identified as interesting they uh, when i was there in 2015 which was the worst drought in 60 years i mean some of those lines they work well, work well. farmers were very pleased you know I, I don't know the reason why it was that but but it just showed me that the potential with small small investments but actually you need the big investments but this was just a small case showing that they tinker with things that, uh, of which uh, uh, can bring results fast and they are not magic believe me so so it's just simple going back to the historical lessons of the green revolution for instance there was a serious investment today it would be a demand another solution or a building on that but it's still it's it, it is no magic it's it, i mean it's clearly that many uh, the adaptation question it has a lot of possibilities mm. i mean not everywhere but it, 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 there are um, maybe in other crops and so on mm. so good luck thank gary yeah <laughs> no magic but a great potential there was one last question you said uh... hello everybody my name is andre marin i work at nora greek um i used to be the guy who helped carry move his office <laughs> so i filed a lot of hand written uh, uh, designs for the seed vault i'm proud of my first job at nmb um i have a qu uh, comment and a question my comment is on the kind of a since we're keeping it positive and solution oriented and so on one of the maybe solutions to to the issue of uh, trust and power and so on would be to to be a bit more reflective about the terms we use the concepts we use for instance thinking about development as something that is not something happening only in the south um, and that we don't have best practices to export to the south uh, always that this these are something things that emerge in in debate and, and so on and that's maybe something to take on board in both strategies in the Norwegian and the US strategy. Also, the fact that the metaphors we use as the car metaphors are probably good to to dispel with. Um, and we not all people in the world look to the future ahead. Some of us look to the past ahead and so on. So maybe those are some things that social scientists can bring into this a bit more self-reflection about the implicit assumptions that we have about what is development and what is to be developed and so on. my question is related to that i'm quite interested to hear more about uh, the role of organic fertilizers because oftentimes mo most of the times when we talk about food security we talk about plants but there's about a billion of us who rely on livestock for their food security in the world. Uh, livestock, as we all know, have received a bit of a bad press recently. Uh, so I wonder if it, there's anything explicit in the US strategy, for instance, talking about organic fertilizers, the role of livestock, and the role of livestock in food security. So there, I think you got uh, both some technical questions and some political questions. So now you can all choose among those uh, issues. And for a last response, um, we have to end. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, I think regarding um, 
fertilizers that we, we have to think in a sense of all of the above. And one of the um, points that I've, I've certainly been pushing uh, in the US government is that we're, we shouldn't just simply be thinking about chemical fertilizers, we should be thinking about soil health and soil fertility, and that's a different question. Um, because uh, if, if only, if only, because um, plants don't take, uh, don't make efficient use of chemical fertilizers unless there is a fertile soil. So yes, I think uh, use of manure, crop rotations, uh, using crop residues, green green fertilizers, all those things are are terribly important to success in, in agricultural development. It's, um, my point is, it's not just about chemical fertilizers. We couldn't we can't solve the problem by just throwing more chemical fertilizer on the on the soil. That's um, would actually, in the end, cause more problems than it would solve. So, yes, it's it's kind of all of the above. Um, to respond very quickly to to Olsman, um, I think um, you know early at least in my career there was the notion that well developing country farmers have a great deal of diversity in their on their farms. Isn't that wonderful? And they certainly obviously have more diversity than, than uh, you'll find in the uh, genetically uniform field in Norway or in the United States. The question going forward in a climate changing world is, if, if you'll take this in the right way, do they have the right diversity? And the right diversity means, do they have the traits in their fields that will allow them to develop in the way, the crops to develop in the ways that they're going to have to develop in order to cope with, with the climate change uh, challenge? Where I think we could be making um, uh, more progress would be to uh, empower farmers even more than they are today by providing them with more diversity and therefore more options for how they how they themselves um, plot their their own uh, future. And finally, a um, uh, a shameless plug here for Olsman himself, <laughs> um, who is uh, the person I think of first and foremost when I think of a, a Renaissance person who. Um, is a um, is a world class scientist, uh, a humanist, a poet, um, many different things. And if you haven't looked at, read, and seen his book called Our Daily Bread, you are in for an amazing, amazing treat. Um, take a look. I can second that. <clears throat> um, I was going to say the same as Carrie in terms of this aspect of choice. I think the most important thing is to indeed give farmers more choices. So both on crop diversity side and also when it comes to particular interventions, because research shows us that farmers often do not adopt whole packages. They take and use what is useful for them. And so to enable access to as many options um, as possible so that people themselves can choose what fits best for their circumstances, I think, is the right way to go. Uh, are we doing closing comments? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, first, uh, thank you. Um, then first, I just want to say on fertilizer, just to mention that on the Global Fertilizer Challenge, I, it's important to say it's not only chemical mineral fertilizers that we're talking about. We're talking about organic alternatives um, and soil, of course. Soil health is essential, and Norway will go in with funding on a soil health public-private partnership that we are establishing at the moment, which is very exciting. Um, I also just want to, uh, being at the university, it's such a thrill to be here, so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, I just want to say that we are always eager to learn more from the research that you're doing. Um, so do please reach out to us at the ministry. Um, Minister Twinram has been here twice already, uh, if not three times. Three times already? Wow. <laughs> Um, and, and she's always willing to come back because she really enjoys it here. Uh, this also means, of course, that we want to hear from you. So please do reach out to us. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here and uh, for those encouraging words. And we do experience uh, Minister Tsvinnerheim as a friend of NMBU and, uh, and uh, appreciate her uh, support along the way. It's been a privilege to have you here today also, uh, Carrie, I believe in the power of dialogue and I believe that the role of universities is to uh, facilitate that. And uh, I remain 
deeply and profoundly convinced that the answers to many of the questions that we are asking are to be found in research and education. And there's uh, almost nothing more important than a country can do like Norway than to make a, the, the maximal possible to push itself further and further to make stronger investments in research and education. That's really uh, the key to the development of society. So thanks for contributing to that. And thanks to all of you for being here. I mean, we have a lot, we, we could continue. We have a lot to talk about, uh, but this has been really good. Um, now I, I, you know, I hope my bosses can forgive me, but uh, you know, I've taken this authority, authority policies, uh, saving policies so serious that I only have two gifts. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you so much, uh, Lisa and Carrie for coming, but thanks also to my colleagues and bosses. <laughs> <laughs>